here to tea, and on behalf of the Electricity Hub, I would like to welcome everyone to the 57 Power Dialogue themed NIPP, the current status and challenges. Before handing over to the moderator, I would like to give a quick rundown of what the Power Dialogue is going to be like. There will be a quick introduction of panelists, then the beginning of the discussion. If you wish to say anything or have and before you have any questions, you can use the raise hand icon on your screen. Now I would like to hand over to our moderator, Mrs. Veronica Osuho, Principal Consultant at PyrX Consultants. Welcome everyone. And um, this is the 57th Spa Dialogue. Very interesting day today because I have some industry experts to talk to us on NIPP. We'll be starting with the man who sits on the driver's seat, and that is uh, Mr. Chine Dubu. We'll have him introduce himself briefly for a few seconds, and then he will talk to us generally about the NIPP, where we are, what we're doing, why are we not selling, and all of that. And we'll have free time to ask him all the questions. We have another person, Eyo Ipu. I call him an industry expert because he's always been here. He, he, he knows this industry inside out. We're going to enjoy his knowledge today. And uh, the third person who will be talking to us is Alex Opo from BPE, Bureau of Public Enterprise. Unfortunately, he's going to be joining us late. Um, an emergency came up and he's trying to sort that all in the interest of Nigeria. So he's going to be joining us, but before he joins us, we will be talking with the MD, uh, NIPP, and we'll also be talking to Mr. Ayo Eko. Um, join me to welcome the first speaker today, and that will be um, Mr. Chinidu Ugo. Chinidu, please. Hello, can I have Chinidu now? Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam. Um, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Chedu Ubo, and um, by the grace of God, I am the Managing Director of Niger Delta Power Holding Company Limited. Uh, this is my fifth year in office. Uh, I thank God for sustaining us despite the challenges. Niger Delta Power Holding Company Limited is a company that was set up as what we call a special purpose vehicle, if you, if you may, to implement the National Integrated Power Project. The National Integrated Power Project is a project of the government the governments of the federation. So it's a federation project, the federal government and all the states. It was designed as a fast track government initiative to add significant electricity to the grid. Of course, with all the transmission, associated transmission, distribution, uh, as well as gas infrastructure projects. It's a federation company, it's a federation project, and therefore NDP, NDPAC is a federation company because we were funded initially from the excess crude account. So all the takeoff money, all the capex for the power plants were, and of course the initial transmission and distribution projects were from budgetary allocations from the federal government and state governments. The shareholding is 47%, 47 
for federal government and 53% for the states. Again, for emphasis, the states holding for themselves and on behalf of the local governments in their territories. Because it's a private limited liability company, at the time they will set up the company, they couldn't have put all the 774 local governments. So they just took the 36 states and the federal government. So I have that seven shareholders. Um, since the first allocation, we've not received um, further for budgetary allocation. Uh, Madam, do you want me to stop? You wanted me to introduce yes. the cyber fire on. Uh, yes, I wanted you to just uh, do a brief and then okay. we get to Ayo to do a brief, then we come back okay. to you. To okay, start. fantastic. So I will stop there. So yes. that is the company. That is, I've done introduction of me as the managing director of this company, and I've introduced the company as well. So um, I think I will stop there for now, and so Thank the you. others will have a chance to introduce themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I have uh, Ayo Ekbo to give us an initial understanding of this subject. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Osuo. And um, good afternoon to every one of us um, who is here um, taking some time to tune into this, um, to this session. Um, this is my, I don't know, third, fourth time um, being a speaker at uh, one of next year events, and I'm always glad to come here. Um, the subject today is a very interesting one, um, NIPP. I'll just say a little bit about my understanding of how NIPP came about and um, try and set some of the context in which um, I'll make some of my own remarks. Um, I, I see NIPP as an intervention that came in 2004, five, um, during the Obasanjo regime. Um, when you set it in the context of the time in which it came, which is just after, uh, just as the Electric Power Sector Reform Act was passed. Um, I, I think the view which I take that the NIPP was kind of an, almost quite frankly, an aberration um, would, then, would, would then set the tone for some of what, it, some of what I, I, will, I, I intend to say. The NIPP came at a time when the government was supposedly getting out of direct operations and ownership in the sector. Um, just as NIPP started, the Power Sector Reform Act was passed, which was talking about breaking up NEPA and carrying out privatization and setting up reform agencies and all that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a paradox then when you consider NIPP in 2005. And I think it is that um, case of uh, Miss Norma, that case of a juxtaposed identity, that situation of not being sure where you are situated um, in, in, the, in the scheme of things that has kind of dug NIPP's footsteps uh, down the line. And so today you have a situation where the government has privatized on one hand, sold off its generation assets, but you're still stuck with a significant fleet of supposedly modern day assets in generation, transmission mm -hmm. and distribution, which has handed over to TCN and the discos, but has retained on the generation side. So you have that paradox. And over time, um, as we can see, the window for privatization has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed as the political economic conditions in Nigeria have also evolved. So I would, I would just leave it at that for, for, for the moment. Um, and then hopefully I'll have a few questions but I have tried to give the context of where I would be coming from as we, as we go forward. Thank you very much, Ayo Ipo. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like us to go back to the MD of uh, NIPP, um, Chini Dugu, please. Give us a general overview now of what this organization stands for. Yeah. Particularly at the end of this conversation, we, we want to know why we are where we are, where are we, why are, why are we there, are there issues about moving to the next phase, and when do we intend to get there. So please just talk to us around this issue so we can conclude. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I will just start from where 
Ayo's talk. I agree with him. Totally, it was an intervention company. Actually, it started as a project. That's the truth. It started as a project. And um, of course, the owners of the fund now decided to set up the company. Started as a project in 2004. And the company NDPs was set up in 2005. I've mentioned the shareholding for 7% to federal government and 53 to states for themselves and their local governments. Um, because of the nature of the shareholding, um, the directors are drawn from the federal representatives of the federal government and representatives of states. Each state, so each geopolitical zone has a director in our board. So we have six governors. And of course, the federal government has uh, four ministers plus the vice president. Essentially, uh, it mirrors the, the National Economic Council. So the vice president is the chairman of the, the board of directors of NDPAC. Um, just to quickly give you an overview of our generation assets, we did, like I mentioned, we've intervened in generation, uh, transmission, distribution, as well as gas infrastructure. But the main intervention is in generation assets. Um, the rest, even though we've done a lot more than that now, we are meant to be associated, we are meant to, to ease the evacuation of the generation assets, generation plants. NDPAC was designed, started around seven, seven million size power plants, that's NIPP, um, and of course three were added later. So the design, design uh, at the initial stage was for 10 power plants. And the design capacity for this 10 power plants it's just 5,000 and a fraction, five, about 5,000 megawatts. Um, presently, um, 4,000 and, and about 50 megawatts have been installed uh, at eight power stations, eight power stations across uh, the areas of operation, uh, mainly in the Niger Delta states. Um, all the Niger Delta states host one power plant, except uh, Aquaibom. And what I understand is that the government wanted to invest directly in a bomb power, which had already taken off at the time. So all the Niger Delta states host, the rest eight host one power plant each. The remaining two are one in Olong Sogo in Ogun State and one in Gerebu in, in Kogi State. Of course, they are both close to the to gas pipelines, gas network. Um, to also, as part of the overview, I'll just quickly we tell you where we are in the uh, uh, development of the power plants. For Long Shogo, which is in Ogun State, we have an stock capacity at ISO. It's uh, about 756 megawatts. It was started in 2007 and it's 100% completed. It was completed in the second quarter of 2011. Ogorode, that's Sapele, it's 504 megawatts, started in 2006, 100% completed. Uh, it's been since completed since 12 February, I think 2013. Omoto Shore Generation, which is in Ondo State, uh, Motor Shop Power Plant was conceived in 2000 and initiated in 2007 as contract. It's 518 megawatts, 100% uh, completed since July 2012. Ehovo, which is Benin, is 504, sorry, Gerebu, which is Kogi State, 504 megawatts. It started in 2010, that's later because it was added later. 2010, and um, it was completed May 2013. Gerego is the only Siemens technology we have. Uh, all the rest are GE technology. Uh, Calaba, 630 megawatts, 2006, 100% completed. Uh, Benin, that is a humble, 504 megawatts, 2006, 100% completed in June. 
Then the problem ones. We have Aloji in Abia State, Bara in Bayesa State, Omoku in River State, and Ekbema in Imo State. These four power plants were given to a Nigerian contractor called Roxen Engineering. Roxen Engineering in Aloji, uh, uh, they, they, they successfully installed the four gas turbines. It was designed, Aloji was designed like a long sugo as a, as a combined circle power plant. However, only the gas turbines were installed. The steam turbines were not, have not been installed yet. Where the equipment uh, were, I think, have been, have been shipped in country anyway. Um, the four turbines, sorry, I don't want to end the turbine. The four turbines are uh, 504 in capacity. The contract was since 2005. Actually, this contract was inherited by NDPAC from the PS, the former NEPA. The original contract was signed by NEPA. It was inherited. 2005, 99% of course completed. Now that's the four gas turbines uh, since May 2015. The steam turbines, zero, not installed yet, but procurement has been done. Bahrain Genko, that's Bahrain Power Plant by ESA, one gas turbine installed so far, 1.6 megawatts. 100%, that's the first quarter of 2015. The second gas turbine has not been installed. We have taken over that and we're completing that. Uh, they are the commissioning uh, stages now. Omoku River State, just 71% completed, still under construction. Egbema in most state, 67% still under construction. It's interesting to note that all the four companies, apart from Aloji, which was 2005, the rest were 2006. Bahrain, Omoku, Egbema, they were, the contracts were signed 2006. Uh, they're still under construction. Fortunately for us, um, Namcon, um, Roxin went into receivership by Amcon, and we have since, uh, with the approval of the board of directors of NDPSC, we've since terminated that contract, and then we've gone ahead to uh, procure uh, new contractors from those who have performed very well in the other ones. And um, we received the BPP, no objection. We received the board approval. We are finalizing the agreements, scoping and everything to make sure that there will be no variation uh, later. So the contracting for that is at final stage or for those. The contracting for those are their final stages and uh, particularly for Egbema and uh, Omoku. So for the operational ones, eight operational stations, about 4,000 megawatts installed, and um, net capacity somewhere around 35, 3,600 megawatts. We've been operating them. Again, just like I or said mentioned, this is an intervention company. Uh, these assets were meant to be uh, uh, developed. Uh, commissioned and of course privatized because from the reform of course which are your um, started champion as well it was supposed to be a private sector led at least uh, generation and distribution uh, segment uh, so at the time as these plants were getting were being commissioned or as the units were being commissioned of course, they were not so ready for, for privatization at the time. And the PSC had to adopt some interim uh, arrangements to quickly um, operate and maintain them because Nigeria, of course, needed the electricity from the stations at that time. Soon afterwards, the privatization came in. So the interim arrangements, interim ONM all remained in place. So we've been on that privatization exercise to date. I will come to that. But let me just um, quickly
quickly take us through the generation the operational challenges because it's part of what I'm asked to address our challenges. First is as a power plant, 4,000 megawatts installed. Of course, the evacuation lines, of course, in place. Unfortunately, the system, the, 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 the system, the network became a major issue. Uh, our first major problem we, we, we identified was transmission constraints. We could hardly do more than 700 megawatts on average from these power stations, even though we had 4,000 installed. Even though out of the first time, if you talk about net, net capacities, site conditions, okay, worst case, we can do 3,500. But we will hardly ever dispatch more than 700. But this is not to blame the transmission company. There are other factors like gas and all that involved. The second one is even when we are dispatched, the dispatch is so irregular. I just use that word. I just chose to use an English word for that. And I also use an English expression for the reason for the that's been ascribed uh, uh, the dream that has been proffered as uh, 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 the cause of the irregular dispatch, and that is what they call load rejection. Um, so take it as an English phrase, not just a technical phrase. They were shut down. We were, 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 were at every given point. In fact, a unit or a station can start up and shut down five times in a day. From my experience, and maybe I will beat my chest now. Uh, sorry, I have to do that. My experience in negotiating PPAs, and I don't think there's any great connected PPA that I haven't been involved in. It comes at a cost to shut down power plants, to uh, uh, start up power plants. Even in PPAs we have, I think it's between 12 and um, 20 startups per annum. I can't remember the numbers, but usually capped startups per annum. But a unit can do five starts in a day under this current market. That's one problem. This has a lot of cost implications for us. So the next, the third issue is gas constraints. Our three power plants on this time axis, the three completed ones, have full gas. One is Calabar. In fact, as I speak to you, looking at my dashboard now, Calabar is doing 427 megawatts now. 427 megawatts. So I have four units on out of five units because we have gas, reliable firm and reliable gas supply, even though it's backed by PRG. The rest of the power plants, the Regu was on this morning. NGC had to shut us down because no gas. And they, from the information I got, the text I got, they call it decaying. That's the word they use, decaying gas pressure on the earth line. That has been the story all through since I came here and got worse in the last one month. The Regu is not running today. Omoto Show is not running. Our launch ago is not running. Sapele is not running. Of course, Ehobo is not running. Gas plus transmission, that's for Ehobo. Sorry, MD. Yeah. Sorry, MD. Can I just um, try here to include what you may have to just try and clear for us as you talk along? Yeah. Was uh, infrastructure, you know, because we one would have thought that the, the value chain would be from end to end yes. for power. And if it is, one will expect that your activity at the NDPSC is to include all of this. So in design, the design should include how will you generate, how will you evacuate? Yes. So will you say that's been taken care of? Is that part of the problem yes, we have? Yes, I, yes, I mentioned that. So <clears throat> all the power plants, except the hover, uh, 
And while, I, while I'm accepting Shabo is that I would talk that separately, uh, talk about that separately. All the power plants have evacuation facilities from NDPAC power station to the network. NDPAC has also gone ahead to intervene in several kilometers of 330 kV lines, uh, 132 kV lines, several uh, capacity, several MVAs of transformation capacity substations you are aware all around the country. So a lot has been done by NDPAC in that regard. I didn't want to dwell on that, but at NDPAC, from my transmission department, they pride themselves of having contributed even some say 60% of the transmission um, infrastructure in existence today. But I would say, no, let's be conservative, maybe 40, 45%. So that's what NDPAC has done. So we did all that, but it comes from operational, it's, it's not, it's system oppression more from what I hear from TCN, system oppression because of the transmission and distribution interface. We've also done a lot of intervention and distribution Several substations, injection substations, we built several, several all over the country, several 33 kV lines, 11 kV lines, uh, distribution transformers uncountable everywhere. However, the distribution companies, we know they still have technical losses, they still have commercial losses, and they still have the main one, which is the collection losses, lack of metering, and all that. So, all that combined again with some of one or two challenges from transmission makes it difficult for this transmission company to take from the installed about 13,000 installed capacity in the country, not just any PAC, that's total, to do more than 5,000 at most. Yes, at most. So we did, we did, we did evacuation facilities, for instance, Calabar, we did the line from 330 KV line all the way from Calabar to Ikotekpene. We did the switching station at Ikotekpene, big station. It's a 12 circuit station, 12 circuit station, 12 lines going in and out of Ikotekpene. And the line from Ikotekpene goes from there up to Joss from NDPAC. Along the line, we built the station at Uguaji as well, set of the art station, just to mention a few. Yes, NDPAC did that. NDPAC did for a hover, 450 megawatts in terms of uh, net capacity. NDPAC did the switch yard and of course the line or the, the station, the substation is called transmission substation we discussed Benin North today. It's recognized in TCN assets, Benin North. is recognized in transmission and network map. From the Benin North to Benin Mens, that's the existing ones, the existing one before NDPAC built. Fortunately, I won't say unfortunately, Azura came to share uh, with us. They came to become our neighbors. And between NDPAC and Azura, we are talking about 900 megawatts. The facility we built, the line can only take maximum of 600 megawatts. There is no N minus one. Uh, there. So Azura is backed by PRG. So unfortunately, we became subordinated to Azura in our own facility. Understandable. But why is it like that? Because I understand that part of the negotiation for Azura is that TCM was supposed to build a line from that Benin North to Oshubo for to ease the evacuation from Azura. Of course, that line. I don't know where they are today. That line has not been constructed. Perhaps the contract has been awarded or the job has not been concluded. So that gives you an idea of the transmission challenge I talk about. All our gas, all our power plants are close to gas facilities, uh, gas source, either gas pipeline or uh, gas feed. The pipelines were all constructed. The metering stations were all constructed. So we have, in terms of gas infrastructure, it is there. What is the challenge, the molecules to run on the lines? And that's why I use, they say decaying pressure 
the gas pressure on the line. That's what I got today uh, when I was talking about Garibu. So we have all the NDPSC, they had uh, contemplated what is required in terms of infrastructure that has been built, but these are uh, uh, challenges that emerged afterwards, again, from different um, parties that are involved. TCN, when they run their issue is frequency. Frequency, as a, again, as they say, as a result of low rejection. Uh, as you understand, Matt, the demand must equal generation for there to be stability in the grid. When there is no demand, of course, the system operator will ask us to shut down. And, that, and the demand fluctuates, you know, in a very ridiculous way, manner. Demand fluctuates, so you have us, you find the system operator directing us to shut down many times in a day. Um, so that is that. So I was just talking about gas. We have more than enough gas for Calabar, Aloji, and Bahrain, but we do not have gas at all for any of the power plants in the Southwest. We need about 560 million scot there. We were only able to get like 60 million scot from Chevron, and the 60 million scot is some best endeavor basis. So they are not um, obliged to give us. It's when they have, when they think it's convenient, they give us. Of course, we are not obliged to take if we are not being despised, that's the flip side. So that's that. Um, let me quickly go through the, so that's with that. Um, so in terms, another big one, I just kept this one. Uh, I didn't want to dwell on this one because everybody is aware of that, is the sector liquidity challenge. It's a, I mean, every operator of the sector, in the sector. Excuse me, problem. MD, excuse me, MD. Uh, maybe we leave that and right. then uh, we get uh, other speakers on and then we can come back to you. Meantime, while you were speaking, some questions already came in yeah. and uh, I'd like you to just be thinking about it until uh, we come back to it. Um, yeah. They're just thinking that um, what will MD be doing, you as MD, what will you be doing to ensure that the problem is solved? Because you are not supposed to operate. You are supposed to build and then transfer. So you are operating as it is. So what, what are you doing to ensure that you quickly conclude this stage and then move on? Are you going to do them one after the other or are you waiting to get everyone ready? So what are you going to be doing about that? The other one is, um, Azura uh, needs evacuation. Now, if Azura continues to evacuate, what, what happens to your own project? Because what it then means is that you shut down while Azura is evacuating. While you roll that over, I'd like to get um, Ayo to come on to speak to us about the issues of privatization process. And then we can come back to you to explain a little more. Thank you very much. Yeah, Moderator, thank you. Um, I, I hear you, but yes. I needed, I had saved some of the issue just to mention that okay. in addition to all these challenges, of course, the low revenue in the sector, and of course, the final one is the low tariff for NDPSC. And the PSC power plants are 28% lower than, than their competitors or their peers in the market. So I can stop there. Uh, when you call me back again, I cannot give you the privatization updates and the challenges with the privatization. I just needed to give you the, the, the overview of the power plants and the challenges in operating them. Thank you. Thank you very much, MD. Actually, you, you've virtually at attempted every aspect <laughs> and i think uh, the questions will be very few because you have um, demonstrated a lot of knowledge about this sector thank you so much um mr ayo please ayo Ebo, can we have you back on can we have you back on please mr ayo Ebo, please yes uh, yes. yes so question question for me so what is the state of the power plant privatization process. Okay. Would you say, 
would you would you um, comfortably say that we are on track? I the answer to that is a very short no. I don't think so. Um, and you need to look at context um, here. So what is the atmosphere, political, economic, in which privatization is meant to happen? Um, where are the investment dollars going to in the power sector? Um, what, how attractive is Nigeria as a destination generally? Um, yeah. And then how attractive is the Nigerian electricity um, industry itself? when you then look within Nigeria. So you, you've got a bunch of questions. And quite frankly, if we are to be honest with ourselves, it's not looking great. So first, in terms of time, the window itself, um, all the NIPP plant, all the NDPHC plant, uh, OCGT, open cycle combined, to, um, open cycle gas turbine um, plant, um, is anybody funding the purchase of OCGT plants these days? I doubt it. When you talk to funders, whether in the DFI space or in the commercial investment banking project financing space, you hear from them, we have tons of money for renewable energy, but open cycle gas, we're not so sure. Maybe combined cycle, yes, but even that window, I think in a few years will be closed. So what are we, what the fleet we have on our hands right now, how attractive is it from an environmental technological standpoint? That's one question. I did mm -hmm. say something about timing, even if they were attractive today. The time or the window that was open for these things to happen was probably, in my thinking, eight to 10 years ago when we were doing the privatization themselves of the legacy uh, NEPA PHCN successor companies which were then privatized in 2013, 2014. Um, um, so that was the time when Nigeria still looked good as a prospect. It has been eight years since then. Um, and a lot of water has gone under the bridge. A lot of things have happened. And I'm not so sure now that um, a privatization the way Nigerians would typically expect, which is sell for value, right? Will, will be able to happen. So you'll have to, we'll have to ask ourselves, um, these are plants that were put down, built 2006, still being built in many cases, um, 15 years later, completed over a seven year time frame. What exactly is the value if the federal government of Nigeria or the Federation of Nigeria in this case, um, the federal government and the 36 states which is to recover some of the investment that was made in this plant, will they be able to get that value back? I'm not so sure. So the context of privatization itself, or the terms on which a typical privatization would have to happen, would need to look at it a little bit. I think that if you change the terms significantly away from, we want to give these in exchange for value to, we would like to find a manager that can come in, right? They are already on the federal government's balance sheet. We are already in an infirm, on credit worthy, if I may use that, if I may coin that, 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 that word, electricity market. If I put down this funding that you want now, what would I get, get back from it from the only market into which I can sell my energy and my capacity emerging or the output from this plant, which is the Nigerian electricity supply industry, which as Chiedu has mentioned, lacks credit worthiness. So you, you, you come back, we, we find ourselves chasing our, our, our tails here. I think that um, going back again into that time window, um, the, 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 one of the, I think, tragedies, quite frankly, and this is not understandable given my background as someone that has a BP history and um, has a reform history. I think one of the greatest tragedies that befell the power sector reform process was NIPP itself, with all due respect. Even though we have it now, we've got to manage it. But if, 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 if you think back, we had so many billions of Naira that we spent on this plant. Look at Ihobo and look at Azura, its neighbor. Azura was built within 36 months. Ihobo was built over six to seven years. Azura is dispatching fully into the market. It was built on a commercial basis. It is backed by all sorts of guarantees. Its energy is dispatched every day and money is paid 
every month with guarantees. That is the way to build a power plant. The NIPP power plant were built more as social welfare projects. All right. So if that is the case, you have a situation today where two power plants sitting side by side, Ihobo and Azura Edo, are going into the same market, but one is recovering its money and the other is not. You need to ask yourself why. One was built by a private sector entity thinking commercially, looking for all the enablers that would, that would ensure that that plant was built on time, on, on that budget, and delivered into a market and money collected for the energy dispatch. The other was built with less commercial, more political considerations in mind. And it is this is the paradox that undermines the idea of a commercial privatization of the NIPP plan. So what I would say is that we are looking today at something else other than a privatization in the classic sense. We have to ask ourselves, what do we want? Energy out of this, um, out of this assets to be delivered into the market, taken up by discos, sold to in, into the discos own markets and money collected and paid to this plant. The only way you can do that now, in my the way I see it, is to look at some kind of management framework, management contracting framework, rather than the privatization. So that rather than an investor taking money and paying it to the Federation Treasury, into the Federation account, take the assets, put the money into making those plants CCGT plants, one, because really in today's world, financing is really dis disappearing, dissolving more or less for OCGT, speakers of coal plant, but CCGT perhaps you might find um, some, some, some investment funding. So we've got to just, I think, reset our expectations around the idea of a privatization. We've got too much political baggage, you know, that this plant have to carry. We've lost too much time. There are so many commercial issues um, that make them essentially infirm and not in the market. So the only way I think you can, you can deal with this from a credible standpoint is to have your investor come in and try, if you can, and I'm not, I'm not sure that it's so easy, to put money into the assets themselves rather than into the federation account. So that's what I would say about the idea of the privatization process. I think um, moving away from an asset sale to perhaps a management contract is likely to be more um, amenable to success than the idea of, of, of a sale itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayo. We hear you say, um, looking at it as we are today, these assets have been developed. There are generally some legal issues around them. Federal government is interested in just let's build, let's evacuate far. I hear you. Um, maybe changing the model will work, like you have just suggested, changing the model might work. And then I think that's a great point there. Uh, those who should hear must be listening and we will include that in our summaries. But there's been a lot of vandalization. Vandals have been constantly around. What do we do? What can invest, what will attract investors? What will attract investors? How can investors come back to these plants? What do you think? So you're, you're addressing something that <clears throat> you, me, Chedu cannot address. Um, the, the, the political um, national security environment in which a transaction would have to take place. I didn't I alluded to it, I didn't talk too much about it because it's not really the, the direct remit, I think, of this, of this conversation of ours, but it is there looming um, in the background, hanging over our heads <clears throat> every single second. Investors read newspapers, they read magazines, they read intelligence reports, they read confidential reports about the country. They probably know Nigeria better than we ourselves who live in Nigeria. In many, in many respects. So again, why would I, this is why I was talking about the window. 10, 15 years ago, people were willing to take risk on Nigeria and its political situation. Today, I would probably as an investor prefer to take my $10 million and go to Senegal and get a 9, 10% ROI 
right, than to come to Nigeria and hopefully get a 22% um, or 25% ROI after I have dealt with all manner of issues. Those days of um, having investors willing to take a punt on Nigeria, I think are gone. And so again, it comes back to the question of how do we um, present the opportunity here to an investing public that is still in some way interested in Nigeria, but not willing to take the kind of risk that they would have taken 15 years ago. That's what the question addresses. And they will look at the security environment, look at what the federal government is doing in that sector, look at what is happening on our northern, uh, on, on our northern borders within our states. The fact that practically mm -hmm. every one of the Nigerian states is now a subject of internal security arrangements with involving the army, the air force, the navy, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, it, it's an issue. But I think that the bigger issue is the one that Chedu alluded to earlier on, the fact of the electricity market itself, because no matter what it is we say, the electricity market in Nigeria is still one that is evolving and growing. And let's not make any mistake about this. Even though our NESI, the Nigerian Electricity Supply Industry, is more or less static, I assure you that the non-NSEI market which we tend to forget about is growing in leaps and bounds every day. People are putting in um, solar um, um, home systems daily. Um, the so-called off-grid market is growing. The renewable energy market is growing. So that market is growing and money is going in there. Let's not forget, in spite of this situation that we are dealing with. So what is right about that aspect of the, uh, of the electricity market that we have not seen in the NESI market. I think it's a question that um, our friends in the BP the, and, our, and, our, and our leaders in the NCP have to ask themselves, you know, what exactly is, is going on? And I'll hopefully I'll, I'll try and address that um, in terms of policy, uh, maybe when I'm making my closing remarks. But really, um, yes, the political economic, the political situation is dire, but money is still going into certain sectors. Um, mm -hmm. Why is that happening? And um, what, what is going right? What is being done right there that is not being done right here? It comes down to one thing, commerciality. Commerciality. Um, we, have been, we have been trying over the last eight years to do the same things over and over again and expect a different result. There's mm -hmm. a certain word that, is def that that defines. I don't use that word here, but we all know what it is. So, why do we keep trying to do the same thing over and over again in the same market and we expect a different result? I think again, we need to just try and change our paradigms, change our mindsets and look at what others, like the Azuras of this world, for example, because Azura is in this market also and it's not exactly losing money, right? So why, 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 why did we allow an Azura to happen and happen successfully but we're not doing the same things that we're doing for Anazura in our own markets with the legacy um, 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 and companies in there. So it's not to say that Azura is expensive or it's costing us too much money because it is costing us exactly how much we negotiated is to ask ourselves, why haven't we dealt with the governance issues around our own privatized sector? Why haven't we dealt with the commercial issues why do we keep throwing public funds into that sector? Because at the end of the day, a generator will buy an asset or a generation investor will buy an asset only because it expects and it is assured that it will receive funding or revenue in exchange for the energy it puts into that market that this generation company addresses. So it's, it's, it comes down at the end of the day to having the political will to deal with our security issues and deal with them decisively, but also the political will to deal with the commercial issues that enable the public electricity supply market to grow, which paradoxically have been dealt with in the non-public market and is yeah. enabling that particular sector to grow. So yeah. Yeah. political will, I think, if, if I may Thank just- Thank you very just, much. Thank you very much, Ayo Iku. Uh, yes, political will. So we note that, and then when we come back to summaries, uh, we can come back now to the MD, MDPSC. 
can we come back to you, please? I'm here, I'm here. Continue from where we stopped. Yeah. More questions are coming in for you, but I'd like you to complete your presentation. Again. Okay, so yes, I will just quickly summarize, um, just building on what we have said and what you have said, the mandate, build and sell. Uh, as at um, 2012, a decision was taken and the privatization um, of uh, the assets, 10 of the 10 power plants started. Uh, the expression of interest was actually advertised on April 8, 2013. That's after the consultants had been engaged 2012 to that point. Um, by, by June, sometime in June 2014, um, the financial bids, because gone through the whole process up to the financial bid, I think June 3, June 3, 2014, yeah. Um, June 12, 2014, the bid opening, financial bid opening was done. And we actually received, NDPSC actually received an offer of about $5.7 .7 billion for 80% of the shares of this company. So for 80% of NDPSC generation portfolio, we got an offer of $5.7 billion. And of course, Final negotiation continue, but just to point out what Ariel has said is still I mean, it's even worse now. First, the transactions couldn't be concluded because of, of course, the general liquidity challenge in the market, which Ariel has called on credit worthy market. Yeah. Two, of course, the whole, not just the power sector alone, the macroeconomic condition in the country, the movement of the dollars and all that. Again, investors uh, had issues with that. And of course, they also alluded to that. Now, where is the money going to come from? Scarcity of capital. And of course, there was a more technical issue, which of course is the power purchase agreement, which is the revenue document. Like they said, people are going to invest. The commerciality of the transaction, people are going to invest and they're going to expect returns. If I generate uh, revenue to a degree, I have to be paid. Every disco current, every Genko currently is being owed tons of millions of Naira. In fact, NDPC is somewhere around about 150 billion owed by the market as I told you, for electricity generated, for energy payments only, we don't get capacity payments, energy payments only. Uh, that's for electricity generated and put into the grid. So there is, like Ariel called it, on credit worthy sector. It affected the first wave of privatization seriously. And of course, where this privatization stored, we, 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 we had to seek the approval of, of course, NCP and, um, and, uh, and NDPSC board. For us, NDPSC board, BP saw the approval of NCP. And we terminated that process. We just terminated that process. However, we, uh, a new process is uh, commencing very, very, very soon. Um, we will keep you. You will be uh, informed of that. Of course, it will be advertised in the papers. Uh, the DGBP expects him to. Uh, I thought he will be here to give us the roadmap for that particular privatization. So that's where we are at. Uh, with respect to privatization. And I agree with everything Ayo has said. I was in the negotiating team of Azura and I saw clear commerciality of that transaction. And why is, why is it all subordinated to Azura? Of course, NDPS is owned by government. Government has a lot of exposure if Azura is not dispatched you'll be paying capacity payment, which is ID market anyways. You must pay capacity payment if you have you are contracted for capacity and you are not taking the capacity. It's not the headache, the business of lenders. That's your business, that's your headache. So because lenders have to be paid, you are there to service the debt. So it is better for us to dispatch Azura and to pay for the energy, at least government can explain that. That's why they have priority in this patch over uh, Bini, even though the 
transmission facilities were built by NDPAC because it's with government money. Um, that's just to, that's just an overview of the privatization status and where we are at. But I can take the questions. Now, if you can give me the questions one after the other, I, the way you want, I take them now. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, a question came in for you, and uh, it says. Considering the start and stop of the units in your power plants against the base load operations, which results to more wear and tear, based on how you are working now, what will you do to ensure maintenance programs are followed? Uh, but, uh, it's a good, very good question. So, base load operations, frequent start and stops, so more wear and tear. So yeah. I don't get money from the market, yet uh, I've incurred a lot of wear and tear because of, again, the way the market is dispatching me. What do we do? Most of, we carry our, we carry out our maintenance. Um, what it means is that the, the periodic uh, inspections it's more like fast forwards the periodic inspections done by our LTSA partners, long-term service agreement partners. Um, a number of our power plants, five of them are covered by LTSs, by the, the GE, that's for GE technology. And of course, Siemens maintains Gerebu for us. So what, that, what it means, the frequent status of means that we have to engage them more often that would ordinarily have done. So it's making us lose a lot more money, but we are carrying out the repairs. As I speak now, GE is at a hubbard doing borosc boroscope inspection, trying to inspect the units to know where repairs should be done. Uh, they are, sorry, that's in Calabar. They are at a hubbard carrying out the repairs. Once they finish from the hubbard that's been in, they move to Sapele. And that is almost a routine for us. We we'll go around and around. Keep, when you, by the time you finish one, the other one is due. And yet we are not getting money from the market. So you can see why I am graying very fast. Why I have turned to one innocent looking young man five years ago to a, a very old man within a, a period of five years, because I have to cope with all this headache and all the problems are, outside the fences of these power plants. They are caused by the market. And that's the challenge, but we're living up to it because we believe that they are, at NDPSC, the important mantra for us is that these are critical, strategic and critical national assets that have been entrusted to us to take care of, and we must take care of them, whether they are dispatched or not. We want to, as much as possible, keep them in good conditions. I say, well, uh, during privatization, they can do all the accounting depreciation. I mean, that is pretty standard. They can do the, the standard engineering degradation. Even in most cases, it may not apply here because even most of the units don't run all the time. But they can do standard, but not that these uh, assets have decayed because of lack of maintenance. No, we are doing everything possible to keep up with the maintenance despite the low revenue we get, and we are doing it uh, uh, conscientiously. Okay. okay, so another question that comes in for you, I want to just quickly run through this before we go to the second part, which is going to be, uh, how ready are you for the second phase? But this question says, given the potentials of solar power, especially in the Northern Nigeria, are there any considerations or integrating for integrating utility for solar power projects in the second phase. Okay, I, I guess you mean utility scale. Yes, um, what we are doing. Yes, I think that question must have been thoughtfully uh, crafted because they've seen that we are doing uh, solar home systems. Um, we did twenty thousand units of solar home systems, and we are doing about hundred thousand again. Um, what we are doing, so I mean, so that's distinguished from utility scale that has to go to the grid. 
Yes, but I, I just want to mention that under my uh, management here, I set up a very, very uh, vibrant uh, renewable energy department. And um, we are working seriously now to have utility scale uh, solar that will be connected to the grid, at least 50 megawatts in the north. We are working on that. We are at the development um, stage now. We are also working on um, uh, mini grids and uh, off grid solutions as well, apart from the solar home systems. Solar home systems are just units you put in underserved, I mean, unserved homes. But we are working on um, trying to see what we can do, how much of uh, capa how much capacity can deploy through utility scale um, solar. So yes, we are working on that. Okay, so your. We, we appreciate this, we appreciate this. I have seen a number of such projects and I think uh, Nigerians are getting quite happy with uh, those projects. Now, the other thing is, what is the status of the second phase of the NIPP project? They are already approved. So how far have you gone? Are you ready to, to uh, go with them or are you waiting to sell? What are you going to do since it is clear that the state is not happening. Uh, the second phase, yes. But the second phase is largely dependent on the first phase. Yes. And the process of privatization of the first phase, that hasn't happened. So we do not have money. Since I mentioned in my uh, introduction of the company, overview of the company that since the first budgetary allocation um, between 2007 and 2009, no other monies has come from any government, any government, whether federal or state, into the NDPSC. NDPSC operations have been largely managed uh, from the revenue we get from the industry uh, for electricity dispatch, which was at an average of 30%, except for the intervention of um, PF, payment assurance facility. Of course, uh, they are now covering the, the balance of the, uh, the, the outstanding payments up to, up to I think, uh, first quarter of 2020. So we still, have, we still have a credit of about 150 billion, largely from embed, again, largely from all, all, not largely all, from electricity generated to the grid. So there is no money yet. We are hoping that when the privatization is done, we will be funded to go to the second phase. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have to say something you about me. that. I, I really have to ask if I can say something about that. Yes. Can I? May yes, I? you can. You can. After me, there will be no second phase. There wow. will be a third phase, and the first phase will be terminated as quickly as possible. Look, let's not forget NIPP was, like I said, an intervention. And what mm -hmm. I hear, with all due respect to Chiedu, um, is make work, things that continue my existence. We're now talking about renewables. Um, at the moment, NDPAC is being beaten up in the market by entities that have better security packages that back their payment structure. And the same thing is gonna happen in renewables, right? Um, a government entity will find it very difficult to be as efficient as the guys who have to match efficiency, right, with delivery. Um, and you know that's that that's just it's just it's just the nature of the beast. So why don't we cut our losses? If you ask yourself, how much have we spent on NDPC since two thousand and six that we could have spent? on building up our other far more important infrastructure, which is health, education, social welfare, right? To fight the war that clearly, if you listen to the president yesterday asking the American US Africa command to come and locate in Africa, clearly we need help, right? We need every Naira, every dollar we can put into dealing with this security situation that we have. Why are we trying to compete after being beaten in the market for the last 15 years with people who will always be more adept, much more deft, much more nimble than NDPHC. Now, that's what I don't understand. And this is the question which I really would like to have answered. 
as Chedu has admitted, we don't see a privatization happening successfully. If you do a privatization, look, give away the plans for a dollar, for goodness sake, one dollar. But if you, if, you, if you do that, right, Nigerians will come to you and say you have sold it to your friends, they, you've sold the family silver and all that, the things that, that are labor people and all the socialists will, 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 will say, right? So a, a sale is not likely to work, right, in the classic sense. What structure can we put around these things that will cut the, um, the, 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 the expectation, the need for the federation, the 36 states and the federal government to continue to put their money, which is becoming more and more scarce, much more needed in other sectors, away? What, do we, what can we do to keep our money away? If I'm a governor of a state today, I will ask for NDPHC to be liquidated. Right, just liquidate the plane and share the money, and let's go and spend on what our, our own priorities at state level. Okay, that's what I would do. And, and and you know, I'm sorry I have to say this, but I think that is the reality staring us right here in the face. And the earlier we face up to it, the better for us. Well done, Ayo. Incidentally, that was a question coming for you, <laughs> and the question was clear and says, what strategies do you think? or do you believe the government needs to implement to make NIPP assets more attractive for investors? Do you think that we should continue this process or stop? That question was coming for AO. And I think uh, you have virtually explained your position on this. So maybe, answered, I think a management contracting structure of some kind you management know, is, 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 is the best or, way. Or concessioning maybe. Have you well, talked about concession? A, a concession yeah. still, still, yeah, a concession would work, but really, a concession is, is you wouldn't, I wouldn't be, be a power plant, a, a gas turbine uh, power plant uh, by way of a concession. I just simply um, um, transfer the assets to a joint venture with a manager, and, you know, I retain my, my equity stake in it and leave the operate, just essentially take the, take the LNG model, essentially, if I may, if I may use that, uh, just, you know, in one word, just take the LNG model, put all the assets. The entire fleet into into a company, um, but I think that the greater requirement is something that NDPHC cannot control, and that is the nature of the market itself. And I, and I'd like to address that maybe at the end and say a few words on that. But that is really what is most critical for there to be a successful outcome to any kind of transaction that uh, we'll be carrying through um, on the on the on the on the on the NDPHC assets. Thank you very much, Ayo. We'll be taking that as part of um, our, our report and recommendation at the end of this session. So now we'd like to take some questions from the audience. I've read out a few, but I can see some hands are up. So we get some people in the audience to ask questions, but we shall be taking only two questions more because I have actually read out a few. And then after that, we'll go back to uh, rounding up. Go ahead with your question. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's not a question, it's more of a contribution. My name is, La my name is Larry. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the problems we are having in the industry is that um, in a situation whereby the remittance level in the industry is just for about 30%, uh, I'm not sure any investors will even like to come and invest in our electricity industry as at present. So uh, we got the privatiz uh, privatization wrong in the first place. Most of the people we sold the uh, distribution companies to, they're not financially capable, they're not technically capable. Like I said earlier, as we speak now, remittance level in the industry is about 30%. So if you are generating... I will like to appreciate uh, for this topic and what to treat it. Please, I would like to know with regards to the gas, you know, what plans do we, because presently in the country we had issues with our gas supply. So I would like to know how you know, NDPAC you know, intend to solve this gas problem for the power stations that are under the company. Hello. NDPHC does not produce gas, but let's hear from the MD 
maybe yeah. some interface uh, problems or issues that can be solved, or maybe yeah. there are ways of solving them. The essence of this is for us to find solutions. So I will yeah. tell you, uh, thank you, Ma. I will just tell you straight up the same problems. If you have money, there will be investment in gas. We are owing gas suppliers too a lot of money. A gas suppliers who are standing aside, there are not, not many gas suppliers are willing to invest in gas for the power sector in Nigeria, even the IOCs. The IOCs are actually being dragged, in my view, in my view, they are being dragged to supply gas to the power sector because the power sector is not liquid as it is today. The gas take or pay, I tell you, I have firm gas supply for Calabar. That's why I'm doing 426.2 megawatts now because I have firm gas supply. But why do I have that gas supply? Because of firm contract. Why do I have that firm contract? Because there's a take or pay, 80% take or pay, which is standard in, in the industry. If I, I either take 80% or I pay for it. And if I don't pay for it, that payment obligation is secured. It's secured by World Bank partial risk guarantee. If Calabar does not pay, NDPSC will pay. If NDPSC does not pay, the federal government, I mean, the World Bank will pay and the World Bank will turn to federal government. That is why, because like Ayo said, is the commerciality. That is why Calabar is there, I must take them. And that's why I have gas. Now I don't have gas for others because there's no such arrangement. So the, there's no molecule for the transporter to carry. The transporter NGC has its issues with gas pressure line. Those are outside the NGPAC strengths. But I tell you, if the market can pay, there will be confidence and there will be investment in gas processing facilities. I mean, that's underpinned by clearly uh, negotiated commercial contracts. That's it. The problem remains that the market is not liquid. If I do take or pay for another uh, power plant, AHOVO, and I'm not being dispatched, I would go into default the next day. Where would I get the money to pay for the uh, take or pay volume, the deficient volume? That's, that's the problem. Uh, I think I will stop there. Thank you. I agree with you 100%. I haven't handled uh, commercials in the yeah. past sector. It is really, really bad. It is bad. Okay, more questions, please. Can I, uh, I have time now to have them. Um, two more questions, and then we go back to rounding up. Just to add, Ma, that um, I agree with what you all said about privatization, but the DGBP, I think he has a different view. Uh, he can craft solutions that will see the power plants uh, being sold as fast as possible. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here. It would have been nice to hear from him too. But we are going to work on the privatization, and we are going to see the best way to let these assets go. Because like you said, with all the best of intents, business, running business is better in the private sector. That's the truth. Yeah. yeah. Very correct. Um, once again, I have to apologize on his behalf. Um, he was supposed to be at this meeting. We had agreed to start together, but um, another very important federal government job took him out. Uh, so we're going to be having him at the next discourse and uh, he'll be able to clear some of these issues. So one more question uh, and okay. we'll go back to rounding up. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Yeah, um, my, my question is, since NDPHC is doing its best to ensure that they generate and look at the depth they are having, about 150 billion owing the NGC and others, now, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be right for NDPHC and the BPE, especially BPE, to come together to advise the government? Because it seems the discos are actually not doing best their, their work enough to generate enough revenue to be able to pay uh, NIBET and then later to NDPHC. Because for example, NDPHC is closer in Aquibom. Uh, look at Cross Rivers, Alawuji, 
to acquire bomb. Currently, the power situation in Aquaman is very terrible. And the distribution companies are not actually doing their best. We are seeing state government coming in to put um, to put um, distribution lines, transformers, and all that. The distribution company is just sitting there. So I think they should advise the federal government to, if possible, sanction distribution companies that are actually not generating enough revenue. If there's a way to remove these licenses in areas where they are not serving, serving well and give to other persons that are ready and willing to provide, um, to generate revenue, to pay um, for, uh, for, for people who are, uh, to actually pay the generators, those, the Jenkos and if possible, the transmission people. Because the Niger Delta is actually suffering from lack of power and we have, look at the installed capacity, the NDPHC, um, MD just met. So I think he has done the position. Can I just uh, maybe respond? Um, yes, before you respond, Mr. Wu, um, yeah. the DGBB is here, Mr. Alex is here. Welcome. Oh, good. Program, Mr. Alex. <clears throat> Look, we can just have him um, say one or two things, just some remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the very first yes, remark, of course. Yes, uh, thank you very much, madam. The very first remark, of course, is an apology uh, for joining this, uh, uh, this webinar uh, late. I am so sorry we had you know, a meeting on the past sector working group with His Excellency, the Vice President, and this extended beyond uh, you know, the time that had been envisaged. Uh, but having said that, it's difficult for me to you know, sort of know how the discussions have flowed uh, and where uh, basically to, uh, to come in. Uh, but just to mention that uh, you know, the NDPHC assets, the NIPPs are a very strategic component uh, of the entire power, uh, you know, uh, power sector uh, value chain especially you know, on the generation side. I'm also aware that, of course, there have been significant investments you know, in some of the transmission uh, and distribution uh, you know, uh, infrastructure. But essentially looking at it from the generation uh, perspective, they are a very strategic uh, component of this, uh, of this uh, equation. Uh, currently, I'm sure the MD must have informed the forum uh, that we're in the process you know, of uh, privatizing some of those assets, uh, essentially to unlock the value of the investments, uh, you know, back to the uh, component, uh, you know, owners uh, of, the, of the assets. Uh, that process has progressed uh, significantly, uh, uh, of course, in conjunction with NDPHC, uh, and we will be uh, able to sort of conclude, uh, you know, in our own estimates, uh, timeline estimates, uh, conclude the transaction uh, you know, in the course of this uh, fiscal year. Um, I you know, stumbled on the comment that was made by the uh, MD uh, that, you know, it, 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 interestingly, you know, being able to invite uh, you know, both private capital, ex uh, sorry, pri private sector expertise and capital into those assets uh, you know, will significantly improve the outcomes. Uh, in terms of, uh, of power uh, generation. We may make the argument that the challenge we have currently is not you know, uh, in the generation uh, end of the value chain, but I think that you know, ultimately uh, being able to flow you know, uh, the entire uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, power availability from uh, source to consumption uh, should uh, improve the experience. Of, of, of generality of Nigerians, uh, you know, in, in terms of this key uh, key utility. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, you actually picked it well. Those were the issues that we needed um, someone from your end to speak about. So that's fine. However, there was um, the issue of where are you on the privatization process? Where are you on that? Uh, are we expecting that these assets will go fast or we cannot afford to let them go now? That question was waiting for you to answer. And then of course we wanted, people also wanted to know what are the major challenges hindering the sale of these assets? So those are the two things that uh, I can see aside from what you addressed generally. We're however going to go back now to wrapping up 
So we're going to get the two uh, first speakers, the MD and AO, to speak generally on um, wrap up. So possibly uh, at the point of your wrapping up, you, you'll take these two questions as well. Thank you very much and welcome from this. Uh, yes, a lot of work to do really for our country. Well done, well done. Ah, now coming back to wrap up, gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you again for your efforts. It's been really nice today. A lot of conversation into NDPC. We're going to have Ayo make his final comments, and then we're going to have the MD of uh, that's Chedu Lo have his final comments, and then we come back to DGBP to have his final comments. Thank you very much. Can I have Ayo, please? Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's been an engaging session. Um, very quickly, I, I'm glad that the DGBP was was able to make it. Um, BP is focused on transactions, but um, I, I remember, and Nigerians may not know this, but BP has been a lot more, in, and the NCP has been a lot more critical to the socioeconomic development of Nigeria, not merely as a privatizing um, agency, but also as a reforming one. Um, very few of us are aware about the work of the of the BP in resetting the pension industry, um, establishing Pencom and changing the way pension administration ran or runs in, in the country. Not not very pe many people know about the BP's role in the uh, in driving the, the 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 creation essentially of a GSM or a mobile um, ICT driven uh, market and what has done what that has done for the economy. Um, nobody, very few people know about the work that the BP has done in also addressing many of other reform measures that have taken place. And I think that that has been lacking in the electricity sector, that ability to drive the conversation. The electric power policy of Nigeria um, was done 20 years ago. Um, I was part of that process um, and we published a policy in 2001. That policy drove the Power Sector Reform Act, which was first passed as a matter of fact in 2003, but not assented to. And then it went back um, in the new, uh, in the new uh, government that came in in 2003, the second term to the National Assembly. And it was there, it then became law in 2005. The power policy says that it will be reviewed every decade. So we are now due for a third review, but it hasn't happened. Um, first review would have been in 2010, second review on or before 2020. And we're now, we're now essentially in the third iteration of the same policy. The world has changed very, very significantly. The electricity world has changed very significantly since the power policy was done in 2001. And I think that one of the um, um, failings of, of, of us as a country is just having a dialogue. With all due respect, I don't think that, the, that where we are today, the, the, the way the market is, is one that can be solved by any small working group, with all due respect, um, that the vice president heads. I think we need to have a national conversation when we did the policy in 2001, it was a very small market. There was a limited audience, there were limited stakeholders. The market has changed significantly. Everybody now has a solution. Every, it's like football, really, and, 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 and the super egos. We all know how to coach the super egos, right? So let our voices be heard. Let's have a session, one week, two weeks. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how long. Call everybody, academics, labor, consumers, everybody. And you, you, you'll be interested that to, to know that you will have ideas, solutions, inno innovations that are worth looking into, and then we recreate a new policy. Let me say this. We are running on a gas-driven electricity market today. The world is moving away from gas. I was shocked to my skin when I spoke to two DFIs about supporting a gas-driven project in Nigeria, and they did not mean what in saying to me that look, we've got tons of money for renewables, but gas is looking more and more like a stretch these days. If it's CCGT, maybe we'll do it, but OCGT, we won't touch it, right? So 
In November this year, COP27 is going to happen. The Conference of Parties on Climate Change is going to happen. The Western world climbed up to development on the back of coal-driven electricity. They've climbed up there. They now want to pull up the ladder. Even we with our gas, they don't want us to generate electricity using gas any longer. They want to drive us into a renewable hydro and solar, so, so, solar market. Are we going to accept that? Why should we accept that? Right? It's a question. I don't think we should. But the way things are going, if we do not have clear policy that connects our energy policy with our environmental policy, with our financing, with our political situation, we're going to have a, we have a, we're going to have a big challenge on our hands. So I think that the biggest thing I can advocate today is for, the most important thing I can advocate today is that we need to have a dialogue around our electric power policy, our energy policy, connect the two, connect our gas with our climate change commitments, right? And be very clear about what we're not going to accept the world tell us to do and connect that with the market that we're trying to, 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 to put in place. To come back, if we are able to do that, then we're also going to look at the sector that we have for electricity. And then the second thing I would say is, look, do we really still need to be addressing a national electricity market, a single electricity market, which is what we have? I think the time has come for us to look at what we can do about disaggregating this market, all right? The Southwest, say whatever it is you will, and I'm not being regional or tribal here, but 60%, 70% of the revenues that this market takes in comes from the Southwest. There's no reason why we shouldn't enable a Southwest market, a Southeastern market, a Northern market, right? That have their own incidents, have their own commercial structure that is attuned to the situation in those markets. We need to begin to look at that. Now, if you did that, I suspect that it would be easier for the DGBP to sell what he actually needs to sell, which is not a hard engineering asset stuck in the ground, a power plant, but a portfolio of contracts that an investor would look at and say to himself, over the next 20 years, 25 years, I will receive such a revenue stream from these assets that would justify my paying X to the DGBP and the federal government of Nigeria. At the moment, that portfolio of contracts doesn't exist. So good luck to DGBP as you sell, but I can assure you, sir, and I'm sure you know this, when the tire meets the road and you're in the room with those investors, the questions they will ask you are not about megawatts and status of the power plant because they know what that is already. It is what kind of contracts do you want to give us? And, and, and he, he would have to say, I'll get back to you on that. Right, because we know the kind of contracts that there are in this market today, they are not credit worthy. So, what do we need to do from a policy point of view that drives change, development, or rather redevelopment in this market, the restructuring of this market in a, in a way that presents a credible commercial opportunity to investors? I think it starts with policy, right? Policy that we can then say deals with the various aspects of this market, renewables gas-driven um, generation? Um, what are we doing about the various as, um, parts of the country? What are we doing about transmission? What are we doing about the discos? Do we want discos to still be big entities that cover three, four, five states? No. Why can't we disaggregate them to focus on individual states, to become holding companies, and then have each state deal with it, its own distribution market and buy its own power from wherever it, is it can, can find it? Why don't we do that? These are my own ideas, but I can show you, I can assure you that if you put people in a room, you will have quite a number of ideas, some good, some bad, some outright ugly, but things that you can actually begin to use to drive change, credible change, change that we can actually live with in this country. Otherwise, in a few years time, we're going to have ourselves becoming our own neighbors, I think. So that's what I would say. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been fun um, addressing mm -hmm. The audience and um, i hope that you you invite me again next time thank you so much madam and to all the participants thank you very much mr ayo april i hear you and uh, everybody in the room i'm reading a lot of comments people uh agreeing with you and sending their thumbs up i guess the major thing we're coming out of what you said is 
disaggregation of the markets. And um, yes, we will put this together as part of the outcomes of this meeting. Thank you again, Ayo. Thank you very much. Uh, MD, PSC, can we hear from you? Thank um, you very much, Ma. Um, just to say, I think this discussion uh, is on NIPP, the current status and challenges. My closing remark is that, yes, money was appropriated to build 10 power plants, 5,000 megawatts. Today, NDPAC has installed 4,000 megawatts. Uh, so that is uh, a quarter, about a quarter of what you have as total installed capacity in Nigeria. Um, so uh, that's significant. NDPAC has continued to contribute to electricity in Nigeria. At least worst case scenario, we have an average, like I said, of 700 megawatts dispatched, unfortunately, because of market challenges. And I've mentioned the market challenges, um, which the biggest being the, uh, using a, a phrase of on credit worthy of the sector of NESI. And then of course, followed by our low, very low tariff, and of course, uh, transmission and gas constraints. And of course, there are a bit, some regulatory issues around there too. So, but NDPAC has at least what government has um, provided for in terms of budget is there on the ground and is there available for everyone to see. In terms of privatization, yes, the first phase failed for a number of reasons, including um, again, the liquidity of the sector, uh, including um, again, the available, um, the available capital in the market and other, uh, several other emerging issues in the electricity market. But we are determined now at NDPAC on our part, now that the new privatization has started, we'll continue to do what you know how to do best to keep the plants in uh, uh, such conditions, in good conditions, in, uh, we'll try to keep the units functional, um, like, the plants will continue to be, I'm not sure you will agree with me on this, but will continue to be the beautiful bride. We have fantastic plants, especially Calabar, Gerebu, Motosho, they're very good plants. Um, the sector challenges, we really need to do, like Ayo said, I agree, we need to review the power policy and that will help a lot in also pushing the sector forward. But the sector challenges we have now, the government, I am not patronizing, I'm speaking the truth. The government has um, good policies, especially in terms of the presidential power initiative. If, we're, if the presidential power initiative is targeted at uh, solving the losses in the sector, the technical commercial and collection losses in the sector. And there's some serious CBN intervention, intervention now to distribution companies again to resolve this, um, these losses. If those are done, that will increase largely the bankability of the sector, and that will help in the bankability of our transactions. I think uh, the DGBP um, uh, will be in a better position again to elucidate more on those points. But to say the, the market is still nascent, in my view, uh, the, 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 the challenges we go through now are uh, imagine, I mean, you, this. This is the first time the private sector is running the market. I mean, effectively from 2015, as a matter of fact, it was handed over to them in 2014. So these challenges will come, but as they come, the important thing is to have the strong willpower to deal with the challenges as they come. Challenges will come, that's why we're here. And we deal with the challenges. However it goes, um, um, I mean, what's going forward, I think, Okay, let me stop here. Let, the, let me <laughs> leave Thank you. Me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, MD. Thank uh, you very much for inviting me. I'm ready anytime, any day to discuss NIPP. We're very, very open on our issues. We allow people to visit the power plants and see for themselves. Thank you very, very much.
I must thank you, MD. Um, I've known you for a very long time. I haven't seen you as relaxed and comfortable. Yeah. You are so relaxed, so comfortable yeah. with yeah. all the tension in the in, in NIPP. Well done, and thank you very much for helping us in this country. Uh, what I take from you conclusively is that there is something about power policy that needs to be looked at. Yeah. Meantime, your establishment is doing everything possible to keep it going, keep lights on without money, without money, without the necessary funding. We take that seriously and we're, we're going to add that in our conclusions. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Now, can we hear finally uh, from the BPE uh, boss? Um, coming in a bit uh, after we have uh, uh, had some conversations, we'll listen to him and then we'll get the audience to have at least one question again from him before we finally conclude. So rather than finish in the next five minutes, we'll be extending a bit longer for additional 10 minutes. Okay, thank, so thank DG, you. DG, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, and thank you to the Electricity Hub for once again uh, inviting me. I'm not really sure that I can apologize enough for uh, for my late, uh, you know, uh, joining of this meeting. But please, once again, uh, accept uh, my sincere apologies. Now, I'd like to open my closing, uh, you know, uh, remarks uh, by acknowledging the very strong testimonial and commendations uh, you know, on the pedigree of BPE by Obong uh, Eyo uh, Eko. Uh, thank you <laughs> very, very much. Uh, but incidentally, he ended up you know, that commendation by, by whipping the BPE and the entire <laughs> privatization process. <laughs> but, but on a more serious note, I think it's important that uh, you know, uh, the participants and, and you know, the platform understands uh, that the power sector privatization in Nigeria is the biggest power privatization program, you know, ever, ever, ever seen. It's the biggest, you know, power sector privatization. And you can, you can Google it, you can Google it. Uh, at the point at which this particular approach was adopted, uh, you know, would we say it was rather ambitious or over ambitious uh, I wouldn't know. I, I think that with benefit of hindsight, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, uh, we may, we should have adopted a slightly uh, different graduated phased approach uh, to the privatization and reform of such a very complex uh, and technical uh, sector. I mean, it's not as straightforward as the telecoms that, uh, you know, Obang Eko, Eko uh, referred to. Uh, in, the, in, in the case of the telecoms reform, there were no really assets to be, uh, to be, to be privatized with basically a liberalization of the sector to admit you know, private sector operators. But, but having said that, having said that, I take also the point that we need to be a bit more uh, you know, strategic uh, you know, and contextualize this reform relative to our own environment. You know, there are, you know, uh, you know, issues being raised about, you know, the desirability of some of the, uh, of the sources of energy. And he mentioned uh, renewables uh, and other such, uh, uh, you know, sources uh, of, of, of energy. But the question is, we are naturally endowed, you know, by certain, you know, types of uh, power generation capacity and capability. What do we do? Uh, what do we do with that? So we have to look at what is in our own, you know, natural, uh, you know, uh, areas of advantage, and be able to structure, you know, our gas sorry, our power strategy uh, along those uh, natural advantages. Um, he also mentioned the fact that maybe we need to more or less, you know, have a central pool for managing, you know, the contracts that would make, you know, some of these transactions. Uh, you know, more bankable. Uh, but let me just mention that, you know, in the past sector privatization process, you have two sets of contracts. 
Of course, you have the transaction contracts, and this will be the share, uh, you know, sale and purchase agreement, the shareholders agreement, and all of that. And then you have the transaction, sorry, the industry agreements. Incidentally, there are various, you know, agencies and entities involved in making all of that happen. You know, uh, NBET is responsible for power purchase agreements. You know, uh, you know, you need, you know, your gas supply agreement from another agency of government. So all of this, you know, really require a lot of stakeholding and coordination uh, by BP to make these deals uh, happen. And I'm not sure that it will be possible, you know, to sort of aggregate all of these responsibilities within uh, one agency. So these are some of the challenges, you know, that you know this uh, this very complicated reform uh, presents. And I can categorize the, the reforms, I mean, challenges on three perspectives. One, structural, two, regulatory, and three, you know, a market. Uh, Mr. Ugbo has spoken about the market issues. You know, how do we make the power sector, you know, uh, 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 commercially viable in order to attract the necessary private capital investment, you know, that will then provide, uh, you know, a seamless, you know, uh, you know, availability of this key, uh, key utility. We should make the mistake of replacing government subsidy, you know, that was the case with NEPA and PHCN with private sector sub subsidy. It doesn't work that way. The motivations, the, uh, the, the, the rationale for private sector investing in a particular area is completely different uh, from the government. So you, we will not expect you know that the a private sector investor will come into the into the into the sector and then begin to provide the service at some uh, subsidized uh, rates. So aligning service with uh, with uh, with price uh, is very very important in ensuring that we resolve the the bankability uh, issues uh, in the sector. And there are various initiatives already. You know, with benefit of hindsight. Uh, and with the learning points, you know, that we, we have gained from the previous transaction, I'm sure we're doing much, much better, you know, with the current ones. I, I like to, you know, inform, you know, the platform uh, that uh, just as recent as November last year, we concluded, you know, the, the, the privatization of our farm power plant. So uh, including the fast power component of that facility. And it was a very seamless, you know, transaction. Uh, 105 billion uh, naira in this climate and during COVID, uh, we believe it's a strong indication that there is still some interest and confidence in the sector, uh, especially with the ongoing, you know, uh, uh, you know, initiatives at resetting the entire sector, the PPI, the DISREP by the World Bank, uh, and of course, you know, the uh, the other programs by the CBN. And, uh, and the Ministry of Finance. Going specifically to NDPHC, where are we now? Uh, we've just been advised by NDPHC that the board uh, of, uh, of, of the company has approved you know, the cancellation of the previous transactions. I'm sure Mr. Ugo would have spoken to why we needed to cancel the previous uh, transactions. The core investors you know, uh, were trying to change you know, the rules of the game in the middle of the game. Uh, and some of the, uh, you know, uh, asks, you know, uh, post, you know, uh, the emergence of the preferred and the reserve bidders were simply not acceptable uh, to government. It's taken us a bit of time uh, to arrive at the decision to cancel the transaction, but eventually uh, that has been done. Now, having achieved that particular milestone, uh, we're in the process of restarting a fresh uh, transaction. And it's going to be a competitive bid. Uh, we're going to advertise for five out of the 10 power plants. And these are Gerigu, uh, Omoto Shaw, Oloran Shogo, uh, Benin, and Calabar. Uh, and these are the plants with the, uh, with the least problems. And as a result of that, uh, considered to be the most viable uh, and uh, likely to be the most successful uh, you know, of the exercise. So we are just starting the process now. We will be advertising for the expressions of interest, you know, very, very shortly. Uh, and we have also, the National Council on Privatization has approved a fast track approach uh, such that we're able to realize, 
the revenues from all of the uh, of all of the plants, uh, you know, within this fiscal year. And back to the point that uh, Mr. Echo made, uh, the industry, the, the 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 environment is much improved now. Uh, there's a clearer line of sight to cash, uh, especially for the discos with the payment uh, assurance framework that has been put in place and the minimum remittance obligations on the part of the discos, uh, of course, being augmented by the central bank. Uh, so liquidity significantly has improved uh, in the sector. Part of that, of the contribution to that improved liquidity also is the new tariff, you know, uh, you know the tariff, uh, you know, structure that has been approved uh, or endorsed by, by NERC. And, and part of that was also part of the challenge that we had initially. The lack of will, uh, you know, to make uh, customers pay for service, uh, and you know, I, I think that we've gotten uh, over that now, and uh, you know, that is of course then leading to, you know, improved, uh, you know, liquidity and revenues uh, in the sector. Uh, what are the hindrances? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that we we have, you know, uh, you know, major hindrances now. Like I said. The initial challenges included, you know, uh, trying to disengage the uh, previous uh, core investors. So we really don't see, uh, you know, any major problems going forward. Uh, you know, of course, we'll continue to engage with the key agencies, NBET, NERC, uh, uh, to be able to at least alter the type of PPA that NDPAC currently has uh, to make it a more commercial. Uh, an attractive PPA for the for the for the uh, for the investors. We also plan to front load, you know, uh, all the requirements uh, for the transaction so that ab initial, uh, the prospective investors know what the requirements are, and uh, thereby shortening the the time period within which this transaction uh, should be concluded. I'd like to end by you know, uh, responding to a comment that I saw on the chat, actually a comment, a, a question uh, uh, on the chat, uh, in the chat room, uh, asking about how effective NEMCO uh, you know, has been in managing the uh, pre-privatization liabilities of the sector. Um, you will recall that the reform program was structured such that you know, the assets both on the generation and the distribution side, uh, you know, were handed over to the core investors without, you know, uh, any liabilities, including you know, labor and all of such uh, uh, liabilities. Uh, so the liabilities were then warehoused with NEMCO uh, and NEMCO was supposed to realize the non-core assets, you know, of the sector to be able to extinguish or meet uh, those pre, uh, pre privatization uh, liabilities. Uh, and I believe that they are doing quite well. Uh, it's not very, very easy, but they are doing quite well. Uh, so well that we're actually looking currently at expanding the mandate and the scope of operations of NEMCO to also include certain po post privatization uh, liabilities, uh, essentially arising from the uh, tariff shortfalls, uh, you know, uh, from 2015. Date. So, uh, in, 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 in whole, uh, we think that, you know, yes, uh, a lot has gone well with the program. Some, you know, uh, aspects of the, uh, of the reform program haven't gone as well as envisaged, uh, but we've learned our lessons, you know, from what hasn't gone well, uh, and we're using those lessons to recalibrate, you know, uh, you know the, uh, the reform program. Uh, uh, going going forward. So once again, thank you very much for for having me. Uh, I, I want to promise that I'll be back next time, uh, and next time uh, I'll show up. I'll show up on time. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. We are so grateful that you took time to explain all of this, despite uh, your running in late. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the, your contribution to this country. Um, while you were speaking, a couple of questions came in, and I'll just rush through because we don't have time. One of it is um, Yola. Is Yola now privatized? What's the status of Yola? That came in while you were talking. 
Okay, uh, brilliant. Uh, very good question. Uh, last week, Thursday, uh, the National Council on Privatization uh, approved the reprivatization of Yola. Uh, you know, having had to deal with the consequences of the force majeure uh, that was declared by the previous, you know, operator, uh, you know, in 2015 or 2014, uh, thereabout. So we have a new co-investor, and uh, that was approved uh, last week by NCP. Uh, interestingly, also learning from some of the things that didn't go well, you know, with the previous transaction. Uh, you know, we've been able to structure the payment, you know, arrangement in such a way that the core investor uh, doesn't have to come up with the entire cash, the acquisition cash, you know, for that franchise area in one go. Because there's also capital needed to invest in the distribution infrastructure. And if, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the revenues just goes to acquisition, just like we saw with the uh, you know, with the previous transaction, the, the capacity of the uh, investor to then be able to improve the infrastructure that makes the experience better for the consumers, you know, becomes seriously constrained. Uh, and more so in a zone uh, as such as Yola. Yola, of course, covers the northeastern section of the country, and we know what is going on in that area, uh, you know, now with regards to the insurgency. So creatively, we've been able to map out the normal zones where operations can be delivered, you know, without, you know, any form of hindrance, uh, you know, collections can be, can be made seamlessly and areas where we've termed to be the red zones. And this is where, uh, you know, the, you know, insurgency and insecurity issues are, are seriously heightened. And it's, you know, almost impossible you know, for the operators to go and operate in those areas in any meaningful manner. So we've taken all of that uh, into consideration uh, and we've used that to sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, structure the Yola transaction in a very creative, uh, creative manner. So yes, Yola is gone. Uh, we have a new investor now, a new disco operator, Quest Electricity uh, Limited. And uh, they've uh, actually uh, concluded uh, that, that sale with, with the federal government uh, last week, uh, Thursday. Thank you. Again, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And um, we're happy about this Eula thing. And let's hope that that uh, changes the activities in that zone, particularly electricity supply. So may I use this opportunity to thank everybody who's been part of the audience, our speakers, and everyone who contributed, particularly, I want to appreciate the organizers of uh, Power Dialogue. We can't ask for anything better. The ideas that come from this dialogue is really, really what we need in Nigeria at this point. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, the outcomes of today's dialogue will be distributed and everyone who participated should be able to get a copy. Please enjoy yourself, stay safe, and God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Veronica. Thank you, Mr. Alex. Thank you, Mr. Baisario, and thank you, Mr. Chiedu. Thank you very much for having us.